What's up guys? So today we're going to be talking about full range of motion and active range of motion and all of that good stuff. Uh, today I watched the video. I didn't mind it too much. I didn't mind it too much, but there was one part of this video by Natural Hypertrophy. I really just, um, it soured the mood. For the rest of the video, you know, it could have been a decent message overall, but I got caught up after that one example. It went downhill from there, you know, but I can reflect and say well, most of the video was pretty decent. I didn't mind it. However, there's one point and it's a strong point, like it's a very assertive point that I, you know, I can't let it slide without giving a counter argument or a rebuttal or something like that. And so I'm going to play the video at the part. And I know some of you already know the part without watching me say you guys already know, but I'll get to that in a bit. The technique, which as I said, are load, range of motion and tempo. And within range of motion itself, I would also like to talk about biomechanics. Because to me, if you do not have a solid understanding of biomechanics, your understanding of range of motion is also going to be wrong. So once again, let's, let's take the stance of someone who says, all right, Range of motion is always the priority and we should always go full room. If you don't, you're leaving gains on the table. Great. All right. Let's look at the Romanian deadlift. So if you've paid attention, you might have noticed that many lifters, serious lifters, cut the range of motion in Romanian deadlifts. They don't go all the way down. They do this because going all the way down recruits more glutes and more lower back. By cutting the range of motion, they're able to actually target their armstrings more. Interestingly enough, I have never seen anyone point that out as being bad. I've never heard anyone say, hey, you have to go for range of motion or else it doesn't count. So this is accepted for that lift. That is great because I agree with the people that do this. But then if we look at a different lift entirely. All right, I'm going to try to steel man this really quickly. So he said that... Uh... Going deeper would put more tension on your ass muscles and your lower back muscles. Okay. All right. First one, ass muscles, glutes. Okay. So if you do a Romanian deadlift, a stiff leg deadlift, I don't differentiate them. They're both for the hamstrings. They both have the same function. They're the same lift, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so if you're uh, doing a Romanian deadlift and you... Bend the knees a little bit more, you will find that you can flex your hips back more, away from the bar, back. But you'll also find that this tension shifts to your glutes. But that doesn't mean the hamstrings aren't working a lot. It just means that the glutes are being more exposed with more bent knees. And if you bend your knees too much, then then it shifts to the quads, which is worse for the hamstrings, but not worse for the glutes. But yeah, that is true. If you do it in that uh, in that style, bending the knees a little bit more for more inflection will incorporate the glutes more, which could be a good thing. But there's another way to do it. I'll show you. So when you do a regular Romanian deadlift, instead of shifting back by bending the knees more, if you keep your knees at the... Uh, almost closed position, almost locked out all the way to the bottom. Instead of bending the knees more, you can flex the shoulder in this direction while keeping your hips in the same position in space. What does that do? It increases the distance between the hips and the weight, which is the goal when you shift your hips back that way by bending the knees more. But you don't have to use your glutes more you keep the knees still stiff very stiff and you get more tension by increasing the distance in a moment on the torque on the hamstrings the hip flexors but you also get that added benefit of dynamically working the lower lats the, the whole lat teres major muscles of the upper back and working the upper back more relatively by moving into this motion all right here's an example so here I'm doing around a 9-inch deficit stiff leg deadlift for reps. So like 220 pounds. But yeah, so in this case, 
I am uh, going well, well beyond what is considered the full range of motion because this is the equivalent of picking a weight off the floor, maybe even a little bit more. Yeah, around off the floor, basically, with no weight. So with this range of motion, if I stop here, if I go right here, you will see I get to around there, which is with these with even these plates if i was not standing on all these bumper plates i would have made contact with the floor i wouldn't have been completely parallel with the floor either but at this point my back is completely straight um there's only traces of upper back rounding because the weight's moving away from the hips as you see as i move forward what what happens well i, I round the upper back the shoulders abduct forward flex forward the scapula protracts forward and i get to this position but what happens i didn't round over at the lower back i didn't round over at the lower back and keep in mind this is my first time using this range of motion i accidentally did this range of motion and recorded it i was not even supposed to use uh three bumper plates there are three bumper plates there you can't see it because um oh, there there now you can see it there's three bumper plates there, and those are 25 pound plates. So that's a very extreme deficit, a very extreme one. But as you see, through the range of motion, what's happening is that the hips stay at this position. Once I get to here, they stop moving back, and the bar moves forward. What does that do? Like I said, it increases the moment arm between the hip flexors, or hip extensors, and the bar. And as I come up, I extend the back, back into extension, thoracic extension, and I keep this locked type position. I shouldn't even do that. This is my first time, so it's really lightweight. You shouldn't look to the side like that. I don't do that normally, but it's so light that it doesn't matter. And keep in mind, this is um, really lightweight compared to what I would do on a to the shins RDL below the knees RDL like I've done many of these All right, so here this is from over three years ago but these are the RDLs that he's talking about the ones that stop below the f below the shins really uh, not uh, above the floor like a couple two inches or whatever off the floor and you know those are the traditional RDLs that he's talking about and I would like to point out that between the two of those variations, uh, this one, the other one, uh, I think I get a better mind-muscle connection with my hamstrings going super deep. And uh, to be honest, I'm going to ask you, what do you think I feel at the bottom of those other RDLs that I did? Those stiff leg deadlifts. What, what do you think? Do you really think I feel my lower back? Even though my lower back's relatively straight. Uh, good luck finding somebody who could get a back to be that straight with the bar the empty barbell off the floor, the equivalent of that, because they're 18 inch diameter plates and that's like over a 9 inch deficit or whatever. And then factor that in. So if I have that much deficit, shouldn't it be all lower back and ass or even upper back? Supposedly, if the biomechanics was legitimate. I'm not saying that, going back to the steel man, that in the case that I think what he's saying is that a lot of experts assume that a person who goes really deep on an RDL, and this is really common, will just round their lower back like a fishing rod. And making that assumption, they'll say, oh, don't do that because that, without going into the nuance of that statement, we'll just assume that they will, in fact, let round their lower back and do it all wrong. And just say, just stop. And see, that's not an ideal situation. That's a mitigation strategy. They're trying to mitigate people screwing up the lift. But from actual biomechanics, um, gee, I'm going to go out on a limb and say if your lower back does not significantly round, which does impair your ability to work the hamstrings when it gets super rounded like that, if it doesn't do that, and you get some upper back rounding like I did, which is great, I would say that it would have no negative effect on your hamstring stimulation. Personally, Comparing the performance to my other workouts, I noticed that my hamstring curls after were weaker than they were almost a year ago, even though I'm stronger. 
than I was almost a year ago. I was wondering what, why has my performance gone up on this single leg that I didn't do for almost a year. And then it clicked, oh, my hamstrings are more, more trashed from those super deficit stiff leg deadlifts than they were when I did some pin, pin good mornings where I went to uh, to this angle. So like a, a slightly above parallel or parallel. No, slightly above parallel. So what does that say? If the ideal biomechanics was that the hamstrings work more in the in the above parallel plane, this plane, shouldn't my performance be better when I'm when I do the deeper deficit RDLs on the leg curls, shouldn't it be better? But why was it significantly worse? By a factor of several reps, same RPE. Because there's more muscle damage in those reps. That's the explanation. That's the TLDR. But also, there's a second point. It's not just about the hamstrings when I do something like that. That's all great. It works the hamstrings just fine. But... But, it also works the other muscles. What happens when the shoulder flexes? See, there's this obsession with keeping the shoulder locked close to the shins through the entire range of motion. I guess that's cool when you have a limited, abbreviated range of motion, but I don't operate like that, obviously. So I'm just going to say outright that um, when you go to the super shoulder flex position at the bottom, you feel all the hamstrings. I feel all hamstrings in that position but you know what else i feel i had a few days off because i was sick so i was more susceptible to muscle damage so i would feel the muscles especially involved hamstrings uh terry's major outer lat wrap around right here rear delt trap more of the trap near the upper trap too the more elevated your arm gets, the more upper trap it becomes relatively on any pull. That's just that's just a rule of thumb. The lower your arm is, the more lower lat. And I didn't feel too much lower lat doms the next day. I felt outer lat. This outer lat wrap around, which is funny. Have you ever heard anybody say that they felt lower uh, outer lat doms from a deadlift? Terry's major doms from a deadlift? Rear delt doms from a deadlift? I'm not going to even make an assertion off that. I'm going to ask you, do you think it's better or worse to get lat doms, Terry's major doms, rear delt doms, trap doms, just from a couple sets of really light deadlift variations? Not even pull-ups, not even rows, just deadlifts. The entire back, really. But that's the thing. The only muscle that wasn't significantly, that I didn't feel any soreness, was in fact the lower back. That's right. When I did 225 last week, the only muscle, when I'm off a few days and more susceptible to muscle damage, the only muscle that didn't take any muscle damage that I noticed was the lower back. What does that say? Referring to the point that it should logically work the lower back more. I'll tell you, anecdotally, it works it less. See, the more uh, 45 degrees-ish you are, at the bottom position, generally I find the more lower back pumps you get, the more lower back tension you get, the more lower back discomfort you get, and the more bent over to parallel I get, the less lower back discomfort I get personally, and the less lower back pumps I get. That's the funny thing. It goes counter to the argument. But I don't make a big deal about that. That could be personal, case by case basis, right? That point was made in the video, and I do have some idiosyncrasies in my lifting. And that's what I try to tell people. I'm like, don't think that because somebody does something different from you that he's supposed to do it like you. But think carefully about assertions like, well, if you do this, it won't work that. Because what if it does? What if somebody proves you wrong? Is it, are you going to argue against it? Or are you going to concede, well, oh, you know, maybe it can work. Maybe I'm wrong. Many times people don't do that, though. Like, like he said, people are attached to their interpretations of range of motion and what it is, active, passive, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think I'll make another part talking about the overhead press, more generalized, more generalized about the range of motion. But this example right here, I want you guys to think about it. I had extreme discomfort in my upper back and my outer lats and my teres major for three days. Three days later when I went to do rows... They are still sore. We're going into the workout. 
I still did my workout. And then you know what the next day, what was still sore? Hamstrings for the leg workout. You know, when you wake up, you can tell a, hand, a muscle is still sore. It was still sore. It was still sore, not significantly. But if it was sore four days later, four days later, clearly the hamstrings were working. It's not a significant weight. I've used 365 pounds on deficits before. And I'll tell you that I feel more, I feel more hamstrings with 225 pounds than I do with 365 pounds with a uh, stiff leg deadlift to the floor. And you know what the equivalent of this RDL would be to that in the same rep range? I don't know, probably closer to 365 for high reps, 385, almost 405. Because I've done the RDLs to the floor with 335. So to this variation where you don't go to the floor with a slow tempo, I would have to load up almost four plates for the equivalent hamstring stimulation. And I'm going to ask you, what do you think is going to be more stressful on the lower back? isometrically holding almost 405 or using 220 pounds 225 pounds 230 pounds in this example where it's so light that it doesn't even pose a threat a physical threat like that weight is something i would row almost you see just some you know something to think about some pushback to some assertions because i hear those assertions with pull-ups and RDLs. People in forums and Discord servers have really tried to give me unsolicited commentary on that matter. Oh, when you go two inches on a deficit, not nine, two inches on a deficit, oh, you're just using your lower back more. Sure I am. Sure I'm using my lower back more. And that's why my back is still rigid and straight all the way to like almost nine inches. Just some, just some, you know, commentary. Getting a little caustic. But that's enough for this video. I'll make another video on the overhead press because I feel like that one deserves uh, also pushback. But for now, uh, I'll leave you guys to think about this video. Tell me what you guys think. Tell me if your hamstrings lose tension when your upper back rounds a little bit on uh, RDL or stiff leg deadlift. Or you, got, you have to keep this super rigid spine the whole time to get anything. Leave your comments below.